These are here are our classes, uh, Emma and Aline and Sunny and Patty. Vanessa's here, but I think she's helping Eileen in the kitchen right now. So oh, there's Vanessa. Okay, let's get going. <laughs> okay. Share the screen. All right, today we're going to talk about uh, the works of mercy uh, as uh, John Wesley, uh, as he started the, you know, as the church started growing. And even in the beginning, as you remember, when he was in Oxford, he was, he would go and visit uh, the poor and prisons and things like that. And uh, as it got bigger, he systematized it and made it into, you know, and, and a lot of the things that he did back then we do in the church today. So we'll talk a little bit about that today. We'll talk, actually, though, we'll talk a lot about that today. Let's get started with our opening prayer. Okay. <clears throat> Let's pray. Lord, your abundant mercy and ever-flowing grace are gifts that are new every morning and every evening, O God of love. Guide us to a deeper awareness of that mercy and grace as we seek a better response to the wounds of the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Okay, so we'll start with the movie, if there's some questions. Share. In this session, we're going to focus on John Wesley's emphasis on sanctification and on Wesley and the early Methodist emphasis on good works and serving those who are in need. Now, we're going to consider the work of Wesley at the London home base of Methodism, the Foundry, and that's where we'll devote most of our time. But first, I'd like to begin by reminding you of John Wesley and the early Methodist ministry among those who are in prison. So let's go back to Oxford and visit the Castle Prison there. From the time of his Aldersgate experience in 1738, John Wesley was clear that we were saved not by our good works, but by trusting in Christ. You'll remember he said, I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for my salvation. And so while he was clear that we were saved by grace through our faith, not by our good works, but by what Christ has done for us, he also understood that we were saved for good works. We were saved in order to be the instruments of God in the world, to bring healing and hope and deliverance and, and compassion and mercy. And, and so this was really clear for Wesley. And this was a defining characteristic of all who would follow him. There was the deep faith in Christ, a personal piety. And then there was this desire to serve God in the world. And this started before his Aldersgate experience. It started here in Oxford, where, where when he was meeting with those three college students, Charles Wesley and the other two, William Morgan, one of the other two, began visiting the, the debtors who were in prison right here at the debtors' prison. This is the castle prison. And, uh, and as he would visit the prisoners, he came back and reported back to, to the Wesleys. He said, I'm feeling fruit is happening here. There's, I'm called to be there. He was also uh, starting work with poor or impoverished children. And, and so it wasn't John who started this. It was William Morgan who started this. But John quickly was drawn into this. John and Charles came to the prison and they began to experience that sense that the Spirit was working through them to minister to the prisoners. 
And so this became a regular part of their method, of their methodical approach to the faith. It was prayer, it was worship, it was the Eucharist, it was meeting together, but it was also going back out into the world to serve the poor and those who are in need. So in one particular week in his journal, he writes that he spent uh, three days here at the Castle Prison. He spent two days at the Bacardo Prison, another prison. And, and then he spent a day working with children who were impoverished and a day working with the elderly. And so continually, this was the rhythm of his life. It was both works of personal piety and devotion to Christ, and it was works of mercy in the world. This has defined the Methodist movement from the very beginning, this dual emphasis. And there were some Christians who looked at Wesley and they said, well, you know, you, you've gone back to works righteousness. He said, no, I know I'm not saving myself by my works, but I've been saved by God's grace for these kinds of good works that I might be an instrument of his in the world. You've got to catch this if you're gonna be a follower of this Wesleyan approach to the gospel, that it includes both personal piety, a personal holiness, and a desire to love God with all one's being, but also a desire to serve your fellow neighbor, to work for justice and mercy in the world around you. And when Wesley was asked about this approach to the gospel, he said, this is just scriptural Christianity. This is just what it means to be a follower of Christ. London quickly became an important center for Methodism. There in 1739, John Wesley purchased an old and rundown building that had been a place where artillery had been manufactured. This building, formerly making weapons of war, Wesley transformed into Methodism's center in London, proclaiming there the Prince of Peace. Now at the Foundry in the 1740s, and that was the name of this space, the Foundry, in the 1740s, the Methodist works of mercy saw new expressions. Wesley started a fund to make small loans akin to today's micro-lending and the fund made loans to 250 people in the first year. On Fridays, the poor who were sick came to be treated and were provided medical care. In 1747, Wesley published a book on easy and natural methods for curing most diseases. Wesley and the Methodists at the Foundry leased two houses for poor and elderly widows and their children. And as at Kingswood, they started a school for children who roamed the streets. The building was eventually replaced by the City Road Chapel, or what's called the Wesley Chapel today. The foundry was destroyed, and all that's left is this sign, which marks the approximate location of the original building. Now, its original pulpit and several of the pews can still be seen at the Wesley Chapel or the City Road Chapel, and there's a small chapel there called the Foundry Chapel where you'll see the pews that were used in the original foundry. Back in Bristol, Wesley and Whitfield each played a part in forming a school for minors' children, children who were living in poverty and had nothing, and for the children of the Methodist preachers. This school was named after the mining region, and that mining region was known as Kingswood. This was the Kingswood School. On the side of the original school is a series of more recent buildings, but also a school bell cast from the original bell on the side of the Kingswood School. Now what Methodism did in England under Wesley, his followers continued in America. In every community, Wesley's followers would seek to serve the poor, visit the prisoners, educate children, and care for the elderly. This chapel that I'm standing in front of is on the campus of Baker University one of hundreds of universities, including many of the leading universities in the United States, which Methodists started across America. This one was founded in 1858 and is the oldest university in the state of Kansas. It was founded before Kansas was a state by Methodist pastors who wanted to prepare students to claim the territory of Kansas for Christ. Many of them had moved here to the Kansas territory to also ensure prior to the Civil War that Kansas would become a free state and not allow slavery. Now, Many of these schools and universities are places where students are formed and shaped to this present day, Baker University being an outstanding example of that. And the chapel behind me, called the Osborne Chapel, was actually once in England. It was built in 1864 in England, and the man who built this chapel, his grandfather, had been won to faith in Christ by John Wesley. The building had once served as the preaching house where Margaret Thatcher's father had preached. And in the 1990s, it was moved over, donated to Baker University, moved over stone by stone here to America and re-erected on this site as the chapel for Baker University. Just as John Wesley and those early Methodists were intentional about living out their faith and service to the community, Methodists in America went on to start thousands of social service agencies, orphanages, children's homes, schools, pantries, soup kitchens, hospitals, and medical clinics, and so much more. As we started churches here, these churches started institutions and programs to meet the physical needs of the community, following Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan and the sheep and the goats. 
Those churches who trace their heritage to Wesley are active not only in America, but concerned for the ministries of compassion and justice throughout the world. That's what Methodists are. That's what those who follow the Wesleyan approach to the gospel do, is they link together that passionate concern to bring people to Christ and a concern to be the hands and the voice of Jesus in the world around them. We've seen that Wesley preached a gospel of salvation by grace through faith. He called people to a deeply personal and passionate faith, but that faith was meant to be worked out in service to the world. Wesley's followers believe that when God wants to heal the brokenness of our world, he doesn't send angels, he sends the church. He sends Christians like you and like me. And this passion for serving others is an important part of spiritual vitality and spiritual revival. So I wanna ask you this question. How is your church engaged in serving others? In what ways are you personally engaged in living out your faith through acts of compassion, service, and social justice? This is what Jesus taught that it means to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And any revival of Christianity that doesn't result in works of justice and mercy is no revival of Christianity at all. I wanna encourage you, this is such an important part of our gospel, not just as Methodists, but as Christians, that we understand we leave the house every day and say, here I am, Lord, use me. And every time we see someone that we can encourage or bless or lift up, we're called to do that. We see our life on a daily basis as a being in mission for Christ. But we also look around at the broader world. We look for the places where our world is hurting or broken. And we ask this question as churches and as individuals, Lord, what role can I play? How can I be used by you? to set the world aright, to bring healing and hope to a broken world. That's what vital Christianity looks like, a deep personal faith in Christ and a service to our world in Christ's name. Okay. All right, uh, so we mentioned uh, in the beginning of the video that William Morgan was one of the small group whom Wesley was mentoring in Oxford and he initiated the, the, initiated the work in the prisons. Uh, can you guys think of a time when you might have been, your faith might have been nurtured by someone unexpected? Uh, maybe a young person or a new Christian or somebody you wouldn't expect to, be, uh, to, to nurture your faith. I think of my mother coming to mind. Uh, she just was a, a wonderful Christian and didn't ever want to be in the front row. She'd rather be in the kitchen washing dishes and uh, her whole attitude. She had a cousin who was also Welsh in town and the two of them were always doing something unnoticed for hmm. someone. Was she from Wales, Jane? Her, grad her father was. Now, she was born in this country, but her father was born in Wales, so. There is, like, I think of, in the history, there's a big Welsh revival in, uh, in Wales. There's a lot of, uh, I think the Methodists were, were there a lot, but also I think it's a big, Wales is known for a place of, really strong Christian faith. So, yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's the that little ways, you know, in service, acts of service in, in, in ways. I think of um, when, you know, you, get, you guys, when they got together, get together and make food for uh, Salvation Army, you know, and you guys would get together and do that. It's, it's a small way, but, you know, people still, uh, I talk to people that are, that, have, that would go to the Salvation Army and they remember the, the lunches that we were making and they really enjoyed it. So it's uh, it's great that you guys, that's, that's a, an, another way of small ways, you know, that we get inspired by people. Yeah, I, I think, a lot, I mean, a lot of times I'm always learning from somebody that, you know, um, I think it's a high lean for one, because when we were, yeah, <laughs> I told I told that story when we first started dating, and you were really into contemporary Christian music, and I 
hadn't been, you know, so I was like, what is this uh, in playing in her car? And then she took me to church that one time and they're playing music and Eileen's just singing. And I've always come, you know, I went to Catholic church, so I had a little bit more, you know, reserved way of, of praising God. So that Eileen opened my, my eyes to that, I think. And so I, I, I was looking for that, I think now. So yeah, which is probably why I'm a Methodist today, right? Probably played a big part of it. Yes. She said she wouldn't be with someone who wasn't Christian. Fortunately, I. <laughs> <laughs> when yeah. when I was uh, still living in Texas with my family, um, I I didn't know how to play the organ, but um, there were two twins. Were, there were two boys who happened to be twins. Mm -hmm. uh, they were Presbyterian, I think, but um, they were. They would play occasionally at uh, the El Campo uh, United Methodist Church. And we had this big, gorgeous pipe organ. And I was very reluctant because I really wanted to learn how to play it. Um, but I, I was quite a bit younger than um, the twins. And so I didn't know whether they would you know, take somebody like that um, who just barely knew how to play the piano. But um, they were so helpful and encouraging. And I think that was one way that they were practicing their own Christian faith by sharing sacred music with somebody else who really wanted to learn but didn't have any other uh, role models or any other folks to, to look up to. So I, I would add them to uh, someone unexpected who really helped her nurture a young woman in uh, sacred music. Yeah, music's a wonderful way to, to um, build your faith, for sure. Thank God for those twins, Eileen. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> yeah, amazing. Thing. Yeah. Amazing Grace was uh, Patty Grandma's, uh, Patty's grandma, Ruth. That was her favorite song, Amazing My Grace. Grandma. Your adopted grandma, yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. She's up in heaven. They're singing it every day up there now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, I love that song. It's a great song. Yeah. Okay. Um, what is works righteousness, and how did Wesley respond to the allegation that in doing good, he had returned to works righteousness? So remember, they, he was saying that he, had, he was, encouraged, he was uh, accused of going back to works righteousness. Yeah. What, is that, what does that mean? Yeah. Right, right. That's what Vanessa said it's your salvation coming from doing good works. Yeah. yeah. And that was a big thing back in those days because, you know, it's um, people accuse the Catholic Church of having that point of view. Yeah, like, you know, it's with all the different ideas of sin and, and um, you know, and, and doing good and they have the concept of purgatory if you're not quite good enough to. <laughs> so the, the, there's a big backlash against that among the uh, Reformation in the Reformation. So, but I think John Wesley perceived something. Now, what did he, he perceive that he kind of realized something about, about what they, what it, that how important works were too. Um, can anybody think of what he might have realized? Well, I, I think he recognized that there were people out in the community who were, <clears throat> were suffering, they were hungry, they needed uh, uh, not only spiritual uh, food, but they, need, they needed nourishment for their bodies. They were, were ill, perhaps needed uh, services of a, of, of a physician or that kind of medicine. And so I think that's, he saw that and saw it as an opportunity to not only help 
a physical <clears throat> need, but in so doing could offer spiritual food as well, or fi- spiritual healing as well. I mean, that's, that's sort of what that says to me. Yeah. Yeah, he recognized the need in the community. And his heart was changed, right, uh, by his faith, which made him able to see the need. Like, is like God opened his heart and he couldn't help but save. I think uh, they quote uh, in the reading they talk about um, in the uh, book of James, where it says, "Faith without works is dead." That show me your faith. Show me your faith uh, without works, and I'll show you my faith with works. You know, and then that. That's why. Patty said she, yeah, you help people because God would want you to help other people. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. So John Wesley recognized the need and his heart was changed and it was good. Man, there's a bear. That's a, that's right there. That's key. It makes you feel good. Yeah. It changed. It, it does. It does make you feel better about yourself. You know, that you feel like you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, you know, that, I don't know, that the world becomes brighter <laughs> when you do that. Yeah. Okay. And how do you think uh, John's, Wesley's emphasis on works of mercy inspire Methodists today? Oh. Uh- we have uh, folks that participate in soup kitchens and uh, with other nonprofits that are helping uh, the poor and disadvantaged. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, we uh, Samaritan's Purse, uh, the things that we do at Christmas to help uh, folks that are that are less fortunate, uh, as well as uh, helping the Salvation Army serve uh, serve dinner. Yeah, exactly. You know. I, I think the nice thing about what I see as modern Methodism is a desire to work with others. It's not a me first biggest, but it's a desire to collaborate and be, um, you know, if somebody is doing something good, we don't have to reinvent that. We can work with them and extend the, the mission, if it, uh, as it were. Yeah. I think you're right. The world's different now than it was back then. In John Wesley's time, you didn't have other religions doing that kind of thing. You know, you didn't have, I mean, it was a pretty much a, a universally Christian culture. Uh, and so nowadays in America, you've got Buddhists doing these things and you have, um, you know, Baha'i faith is big in, in that sort of thing as well. And there's all sorts of other different religions that do that and we can join with them and do that as well. And we could do our own thing too. You know, mm-hmm. um, I think we kind of work to separate our, sometimes our, um, we share our Christian faith in the work that we do and 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 the people are interested, like uh, we share that. Um, it's, it's interesting, we had, today we had some people in the, some guys in the church that uh, I know from the food pet that come to the uh, Maui Rescue Mission. And uh, it was nice to see them at church today. We had uh, Daniel and Joseph and Fletcher were there today. And uh, yeah, I saw Daniel. It's like Daniel's second week coming. And Christopher would come now and now and again then too. So it's nice because they it's it's a place for them. And and you know Fletcher wore a black suit. He looked really formal today. <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah, it's like it's great because it's like. You know, they, they came because they know me now. And so they said, oh, I'll, go, I'll come to your church on Sunday. And here they are. And yeah, that spreads the light of Christ, I think, just by just in the just being a good person in the world. Just being somebody that will accept people for who they are. I think that's right. It is very cruel when other people sees other people. You're right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so... <clears throat> Very cool. So uh, the the uh, John Wesley's we uh, would would visit uh, started out in Oxford visiting debtors' prisons. Do you guys know what a debtors' prison is? Something we don't have today, thank goodness. Hopefully, well, we might have them again. <laughs> but uh, uh, basically, if you had debt, 
uh, and you couldn't pay it, you had to serve prison time. Uh, and so you'd end up in jail for a while. And some whole families would end up in these debtors prisons sometimes. And there was one close to him in Oxford. And so he would visit that and preach. And also they would go there to teach the children as well. Um, so he would visit desert debtor, debtors prisons. And uh, that uh, the historian, uh, we, I read his book in my history of United Methodism class, Richard Heitzenrader points out that Wesley's scheme of pastoral visitations in 1731, when he was at Oxford, he wrote this in his diary. On Monday, he would visit uh, Bocardo prison. On Tuesday, he would visit Castle prison. On Wednesday, he would go teach the children. Thursday, go back to Castle prison. Friday, back to Bocardo. Saturday, Castle. Sunday, the poor and elderly. Every day during the week, he was out there doing something. Um, and it was, uh, he had a very rigid schedule. It's, it, it, he's kind of an amazing guy, really, when you think of all the things this guy did. <laughs> It tires me out just reading it. So he was, it was, that was the big thing for him. And he also traveled. Uh, so once he, after he had his religious experience and he had that, um, that, you know, uh, ex experience that drove about an encounter with the Holy Spirit, he then, from his, we talked about last week, from his friend um, George Whitfield, learned about printing, uh, uh, preaching in the fields because he was, very uh, blunt in his sermons, and he would make the, uh, sometimes he would make the uh, other preachers upset, and they didn't like having them preach in his church, so he would preach in the fields, and he would get thousands of people. Uh, next week, we'll talk about some of the backlash he experienced from that. It's really quite incredible, but uh, we'll talk a little bit about when he was out there and he encountered people, he also realized that these, that people needed, um, religious uh, discipline in their lives. And so that's where he came up with his uh, structure for Methodism. Uh, and a big thing uh, early on was education. He and George Whitfield started uh, the uh, Kingswood Chapel, uh, King, I'm sorry, Kingswood Schools. And it was an also, so as, uh, as Adam uh, Hamilton said, education was always an important part of Methodism. Uh, we built universities throughout the country um, and we, in, in U.S. and England, and schools. He built uh, primary schools in England. Illiter illiteracy in the 18th century has been estimated as 80% of the population back then. And John Wesley rejected the current, they didn't have public schools, or public schools in England were actually kind of like private schools. They were expensive. Uh, they weren't like free public schools like we have today. And he rejected the current guidelines of this day and that it was bad policy to educate the poor. So he uh, took special steps to educate, first to educate his lay preachers because a lot of these people were just ordinary guys and, and eventually women too. He had women lay preachers, although he called them exhorters instead of preachers because uh, the church, the Anglican church wouldn't accept them as preachers, but they still preached regardless of what they called them. Uh, it's a preacher, but basically it's someone who, uh, it's sort of an informal form of preaching, supposedly. But they had some really good women preachers that drew in in the, United, in the history of the United States. Uh, we'll talk about a couple of those in a couple weeks. They drew thousands of people, even presidents, to hear them speak because they were so good. Uh, John Wesley wrote 233 books and pamphlets, including the history of England, a survey of the wisdom of God and creation and at least five grammars of other languages and many other books. I don't know where this guy found the time to do all this stuff. <laughs> John Wesley sought the diffuse knowledge and as, as, as much as uh, the diffusion of knowledge as much as the diffusion of the gospel. You, both were important to John Wesley. To understand the gospel, you had to have an education and he wanted ordinary people to understand. He believed that his lay preachers must be educated if they were going to preach and he would, he would make sure that they knew what they were talking about before they went out in the field. Um, they were his preachers because he had no choice but to educate them. He, there weren't enough people uh, early on in the movement. There weren't enough ordained ministers that would go out into the field and do things. And uh, 
He declared that uh, con the, uh, that reading, practice of reading, con contract as habit for it. Um, I'm sorry, contract a habit for it by use or return to your trade. So basically, he, these preachers had to also be good readers. Wesley declared Methodists may be poor, but there's no need for that they should be ignorant. And uh, Kingswood School was a boarding school to open to the sons of all who could pay the small fees. And parents would not see their children until their family finally, until they finally left school. So a lot of boarding schools like this in England uh, were like this in England. Um, the curriculum included courses in classical languages, Hebrew, philosophy, and mathematics. And a lot of these kids were coal miners children. So this is quite a, a, a change. The hours were long and there were few relaxations. I think he expected people to be like him probably. Uh, established in 1748. They're uh, coal, people that work in coal mine. Yeah. Yeah. In 1749, John Wesley began writing a book of, called the Christian Library that he would have his preachers read. Uh, this grew to 50 volumes, and the collection served uh, preachers, although its expense proved too great for the masses, so he couldn't produce this for everybody. Uh, all 30 volumes of John Wesley's A Christian Library are scanned, and you can read them if you'd like uh, at wesley.nnu.edu. He also published his journals, so all of his thoughts uh, that he would write, even his, his experiences in Georgia, all those were published. And you can imagine they were also used as fodder for his critics. They would read this and they'd see the things that John Wesley was saying and they would criticize him for it. But he had a pretty thick skin. And these are his handwritten journals. He also published his sermons, three volumes of sermons. Uh, I've read some of them, they're really interesting. I've had one of my, in my uh, United Methodist doctrine class, I think it was, we had to read through the sermons, summarize them, and, and rewrite them in modern English. You know, like a modern, Pastor, like, yes. Pastor John, what does the M-A after John Wesley's name? A Master of Arts. M oh, okay. Yeah. So that was an educational degree. Yeah, it was, a, and in, in Oxford, that's a big thing. That was more like a doctorate in Oxford. Mm -hmm. A bachelor would have been like a master's here. I don't even know, like he, once he graduated, he was a fellow at Oxford. He claimed it for the rest of his life, but supposedly but, uh, fellows had to be bachelors. So when he married, he was not supposed to be a fellow, but that didn't stop him from claim, putting it on his title. <laughs> so it says right here, John Wesley M.A., fellow of Lincoln College, Oxford. And they also produced the magazine, Ar Armenian Magazine, which talked about uh, the Armenian uh, form of faith. We, we talked about how Armenianism versus Calvinism uh, that uh, believed in universal atonement and, and didn't believe in predestination and all that other stuff that the Calvinists believed. And they would argue. See, when he published these magazines, people would write letters uh, in the papers and they would have arguments back and forth in the papers over the things that that they would write in these magazines. And then um, one of the books that's still published today is the, the Book of Discipline, which is our book of rules in the United Methodist Church. And after every general conference, in those days it was annual conference because it wasn't really that big in those days. But after every conference, they would publish a new cop version of the Book of Discipline. So we should have another version in our next um, general conference. And this one is from America in 1784, the first annual conference in America. And, uh, and so that would, John Wesley was still alive and, and he had, um, John Wesley had uh, ordained Francis Asbury, Asbury to be the, um, the first, uh, well, I guess he was a, a superintendent back then uh, for the Americas. And here's the first Methodist conference was in 1744. I think it was in Bristol. Also, uh, as Adam Hamilton mentioned that John Wesley uh, published a book uh, on uh, health called The Primitive Physic, 
where he had all these different, um, uh, all these different uh, re remedies for uh, maladies. So uh, it's an expression of his conviction that God desires to heal soul and body together to provide us all with inward and outward health. Wesley longed for Christians to see the participation in God's work as truly holistic salvation involved nurturing not only our souls, but our, also our bodies and addressing both of these dimensions in our outreach together. So one of the examples is uh, for a bruise, he has a remedy. Uh, immediately apply a treacle, which I guess is like a, I think soaking like a, I think it's a bag of herbs, I think together. Uh, brown, uh, tree, spread on brown paper, I guess. And uh, of clarified honey, rub it with one spoonful of oil of turpentine and two neats foot oil. <laughs> or apply as a plaster of chopped parsley mixed with butter. Or a, a fomentation of bear juice and chamomile flowers. I don't know where he got all of these things, but uh, he, he had a lot of home remedies. Probably his mom, I would imagine. I don't know. Okay, so in London, his first uh, house there was called the Foundry. Uh, Adam Hamilton mentioned that the, the building no longer exists. And at that Foundry, they would, he would, they would have preaching and classes and uh, meetings, but also he did his own form of micro lending where they would pool funds and loan people money who needed uh, money. And in the first year, they made loans to 250 people wow. in that group. And on Fridays, he would have the poor and sick come to be treated for help. Because back in those days, you know, he was probably a better doctor than most of the doctors that existed in those times. Remember, those are the times of leechings. <laughs> so I imagine leeching, where they'd apply a leech on you to let the blood out. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know if he practiced that, but I don't think he did, but I think his remedies would have been better than having a leech applied to you. And then they would hand out what they call, um, after, after his sermons, they would hand out these tickets, which are called love feast tickets, where they come and sort of take an informal communion together. And uh, they would show this at the door and they would come in. That means that they have seen the, uh, the preacher. So John Wesley developed through this time a process, a uh, way of salvation through grace. First, he talks about prevenient grace, where God is, before you be believed, God's calling you to belief throughout your life. Even though you don't believe, you can see signs of, of God working in your life when you look back. And then you realize you become convicted of your sin. You realize the mistakes that you made, and then you ask for forgiveness, and then you feel God's justification, that you realize that Jesus forgives you, and then you have an assurance of your faith. And then you're kind of reborn, regenerated into a new person. Uh, your life changes. And this process of sanctification takes place where you, um, you become a better person over time. Uh, you start, your, manner is, your manners are better. You're not as um, angry all the time, maybe. And you're not, you know, you're, you're more pleasant to be with. Uh, that, that whole process of sanctification, until you get to a point what they call Christian perfection, where by the end of your life, hopefully you've achieved, you're just what they would call a mensch, a good, an all around good person, <laughs> what their Jewish people call a mensch. <laughs> uh, and then final salvation, of course, when, you, when, we, when we meet the Lord in heaven. So that's his way of salvation. And, and so he developed a systematized process for getting to this point through his, uh, through his um, this structure in the church. So we'll get into that a little bit. Uh, we have societies, and societies were uh, you'd come to hear a, a preacher and you'd be invited to come to a meeting inside of one of those meeting halls. And uh, there'd be a, like be a group of people and you'd listen to preachers inside the, the meeting hall. So what would happen is maybe you'd go see an outdoor preacher and you'd say, boy, these people seem interesting. I want to find out more. And they say, well, come friend, come to our love feast or whatever. Come to this, come to the uh, our room. And they have people come in into the meeting halls and they would join the society. But to be, and so societies, um, if they wanted to be a Methodist, they had to, people had to be a part of a society and, and a class. And we'll talk about a class in a second after we get through societies. Societies were familiar to the people. I mean, what, this wasn't a new concept for John Wesley. We talked about how 
John's parents were part of the Society for the Perpetuation of Christian Knowledge or the, uh, all these different societies that existed where people got together and meet and talk about their faith. Uh, so those existed in the past and John Wesley was just starting his own within the Methodist Church. He started this because he was part of the society uh, that the Moravians had set up at Fetter Lane. And uh, he realized over time that he had theological differences with the Moravians and he started his own, at least his own societies. And then the, he started one in Bristol. First, they were small and they met in people's homes, but as they got bigger, that's when they built the new room. They would meet uh, once a month or even uh, once a quarter, uh, function for large groups, worshiping together, singing, praying, preaching, exhortation, similar to a worship today. So people, these people were also Anglicans. So they were expected to go to church too, to a regular Anglican church. So this was something that they would do on the side. But you know, I think there were probably some people that went to these societies that went to the Anglican churches less often probably, only probably to take the sacraments and they would spend, the, they would worship here in the society meetings because there was a push during John Wesley's time to break away from the Anglican church. But John Wesley didn't want to do that because that would make them like second class in the society. They worship, we, uh, well, everybody worships a little different. What do you mean by different? They worship similar to what we do today. Patty asked if they worship differently. And yeah, I mean, every, every church is a little different, but it was similar to what you would see today, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. <coughs> Condition for member participation in society a class, and it says here, the desire to flee the coming wrath. Uh, because, you know, like today, uh, people believe that Jesus was coming back soon and that we had to get right, you know, in our lives. Whenever this is well fixed, it will be shown by its fruit. And so it was expected that all would continue to show evidence of the desires for their salvation. Uh, John Wesley, okay. In the fall of 1738, John Wesley preached and there was a response. They asked him, what do we do? And they asked him to, they asked him to pray with them and help them. And he asked if they could meet on Thursday evenings. And that was the birth of the society. Uh, he had a, seen a number of sources with this type of activity and knew a biblical basis for it. It did not come out of the blue for John Wesley. Uh, societies also became a thing in America. Francis Asbury is our fir first bishop of, of the church in of the Methodist Church in America it's because after the revolution the um, the Methodists in America split off from the Anglicans and formed the Methodist Church and um, Francis Asbury uh, said uh, so he perpetuated uh, what he learned from John Wesley uh, because he was ordained by John Wesley uh, in England would it be not well well to have a congregation and a society an outward and inward court. If this inward court or society were divided into small bands and classes and to be called together weekly by men and women of the deepest experience and appointed for that work and asked about their souls and the dealings of God with them and to join in prayer one or two of, or all for them that have freedom, I think the Lord would come upon them. So these were considered even when the church was founded sort of an auxiliary to the church. It was something that you, it was like, it was like Sunday school today. Like this is today, this is kind of like a class meeting. Okay, we talked last week about the, there were rules for society. First was to do no harm. These are the general ones, do good and attend upon the ordinances of God through prayer, searching the scriptures, Lord's Supper, fasting, Christian conference, and, uh, and that, so that, those are the rules. These, these are the published rules that, he, that John and Charles Wesley uh, put, uh, put forth for societies. And, uh, and next we'll go to, to bands. Uh, bands are, well, actually maybe we should do classes first because I think it works better that way.
classes. Okay, here we go. God is the first object of our love. It is the next office to be, to bear the defects of others. And we should begin the practice of amidst of this amidst our own households. So Methodists' homes and families were also expected to worship, worship together every day. They had a, every family had a hymnal. So they would sing hymns and maybe read some scripture together. And, and, the, and they would, the parents would share their, um, uh, you know, their interpretation with the children, and they would have conversations in the families. It's good to renew ourselves from time to time by closely examining the state of our souls as if we had never done it before, for nothing tends to, full the, to, to the full assurance of faith than to keep ourselves by this means of humility and the exercise of all good works. So in the, in the society meetings, they would give people uh, tickets to classes, that people can attend and so the people know that they've been to a society meeting and so they now uh, can go to the class and so the classes were actually where they collected the offerings they didn't collect the offerings in the society meetings oh. yeah uh, I think it's probably because you know you figured he wanted people to give a commitment to the faith first he, and, and if you were new he didn't expect people to give money right away uh, it was possible to backslide in faith, and therefore uh, they needed someone to watch over their, uh, each Christian in their journey to holiness. Growth takes place best in small groups. Groups allow for the exercise of the, of the priesthood of believers by showing how each can serve. Good for Christians and searching to hear each other's joys and concerns and have the Christian journey modeled. So here's an example of the collection of offerings that they would have so they would everybody would know who's given what and i'm pretty sure that they probably would i think the class leaders would come around to your house if you haven't been uh, keeping up with your offerings <laughs> uh, we're going to kind of skip through some of these because we're running low on time so classes met uh weekly uh they there's small there's a small community prayer testimony about their people's experiences with god Encour encouragement to maturity, modes of proclamation, preaching, teaching, exhortation, testimony. People would give testimony and sing. And the goals of discipleship were, because um, a lot of people would join these classes and they would not necessarily be a Christian yet. There is one man uh, who attended class meetings for 40 years before he decided to give his life to Christ. He was 72 and finally he decided to be a Christian. So it was open to all people. Uh, and we see this phrase a lot. John Wesley, I think, would give this in his sermons. Flee the coming wrath. <laughs> uh, okay. Here's an example of, of a class with an opening hymn. There's a short invocation. It's a little bit like a service. A hymn, scripture reading, hymn, four testimonies, uh, four more testimonies, four more testimonies, <laughs> etc. So you keep, people would give up, get up and give their testimonies. And leaders, general observations and prayers for the menu members, hymns, four verses, followed by roll call, two short prayers by members, and a benediction by the leader. Key questions that they would ask in class were, how does your soul prosper? And uh, there were usually 10 to 12 members in the class, and they were also men and women together. and married and single, so all types of people. They promoted fellowship, encouragement, links to social concerns, pastoral oversight, and leader development. Okay, I'm gonna go up to bands real quick, uh, and we'll skip through some of these. Uh, bands were smaller, three to four people usually, sometimes, but sometimes up to 10. They're divided by, so they'd have men's group, women's groups, uh, different age groups, married groups, single groups, uh, the goal is confession, prayer, and spiritual growth. It was very open and honest. These were people that you knew the best and you felt comfortable with. And uh, you couldn't join this without being this group without being in a society. But you don't have to be in a band to be a member of the society. These were for people that were growing in faith and pressing on to sanct sanctification. So these were people that did make a commitment to, to, uh, to Jesus.
Uh, okay, we've covered some of this. We'll skip there. They met weekly. Uh, their goal was sanctification. They watched over one another in love. Uh, activi activities included confession and prayer. A fuller, fuller inquiry was made into the behavior of each person. So each person was, would get up there and share their struggles, almost like going to confession uh, for a lot of these people. And they would watch over each other in love. I think today these are more like our like close friendships you might have with people, maybe when you have prayer groups or Bible study with some close friends. We, that would be a, a similar thing to what, what this was. And they would uh, sing and, and give testimony. Okay. Heitzen Raider says that uh, we're not so much spiritual elitist groups in the leader monitored, in which the leader monitored the perseverance of the saints as they were more collegial groups that stressed nurture by means of mutual accountability, confession, and growth in grace through Christian fellowship and religious conference. They had special select bands for those who had received missions for, from sins and were leading an exemplary life, and penitent bands, uh, supposed uh, suppose a justified person settled again upon his lees, sank into drugs, for example, or dregs, sank to his dregs. This is a quote from Charles Wesley. He is now a far worse state than if he had never had tasted the graces of God from which he has fallen. He never can recover till he can, claim, can come to Christ as he did at first, a poor, damned, unjustified sinner stripped of all. So there were penitent bands of people too that were going, that were struggling with their faith. Maybe today it would be like um, people struggling with addiction might be, uh, might be similar to something like that. Yes, alcohol would be an addiction. Okay, select bands. Uh, so they agreed to be confidential. They didn't share what they had they'd said with others. Um, they, had, uh, they had their own distinguishing tickets. Uh, so select society was viewed as consisting of those who part were partakers of the great salvation that is entirely sanctified. Okay, so we've covered classes, and now we will mention the difference of, of classes and bands as were those going on to perfection, then bands didn't last, but classes were, were required in England and U.S. throughout the 19th century. So Bands as a formal structure didn't exist in the, in the, in the church uh, too much into the 19th century. But classes con con continued and they're like what we're doing today, like a Sunday school class. I would say that bands do uh, continue in your close friendships with people uh, that you might have, uh, that you share. I know we, we pastors get together some, and share our struggles together. That's kind of like a band. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's true. Vanessa was pointing out she likes that bands are people that uh, like minded people, people going through the same things uh, where uh, and so you can share, you know, uh, what each each person is going through. Right. And you can. Yeah. Wesley designed class meetings for those seeking salvation while he intended band meetings for those who had found salvation and were going on to perfection. Uh, classes were more, uh, yeah, we mentioned all this already, okay. Um, also, it was important for pastors or uh, preachers to go and do one-on-one -on -one visitations. Each class member was expected to meet with a pastor or class leader at least once a year to discuss if converted where spiritual journey, whether the spiritual journey was going well and where not, and how moving on, they were moving on to perfection. Each household leader expected to lead household, to lead house spirituality and was accountable to the pastor for each person's spirituality. You can imagine that today if I went over to people's houses and said, so how often are you? Uh... <laughs> yeah. In his minutes on several occasions, he writes, let every preacher have a catalog 
for those in each society go to each house. Will you preach each morning and every evening endeavoring not to speak too long or too loud? Will you diligently instruct the children in every place? Will you visit a, from house to house? These are some of the questions they would ask. He would ask the preachers. In every town, visit all you can from house to house, I say, all you can, for there will be some you cannot visit. Why visit? To look upon people in love, caring took place in body and soul, but the emphasis was on the soul. To know people inwardly and outwardly so that they might be assisted in their deepest needs, both body and soul. So the legacy of all this in John Wesley's time was um, this, what, what uh, we have today, as you shared, Roz, with all the different groups today that are doing this as well. Hundreds, if not thousands of inner city ministries, medical clinics, hospitals, orphanages, I would say universities, and more have started across the United States, Great Britain, and around the world uh, by Methodists who are carrying on, a, on these traditions established that were established at the foundry. So, so as we finish discussing some of the things that the early church was doing uh, to, um, you know, and how it was growing, if you think of some of the wounded places in our world or in our neighborhood, how might they change for the better if churches implemented John Wesley's concept of two halves of faith with the personal salvation and the ministry to the needy? And how might each side benefit, each side of the faith benefit from the other? We'll start with the first one. How might our communities change if we, if more churches did this? So I'm going to repeat what Vanessa said. Uh, yeah, we'd probably have, you know, people would be more educated. Uh, we'd have more programs, right, to help people. Uh, and um, what was the last part you said? Better quality, of life. Better quality of life, I think, if churches did this. You know, it's interesting, this conversation now, because we've seen coming 200 years after this, there have been periods, there have been examples of, of abuse in, in churches, right? So uh, I think it's good that we've developed ways to, that we're developing ways to hold people accountable, leaders and Christian leaders. I mean, I think in, in Wesley's time, this was all very new. Um, I don't know, and there's probably no documentation if there's any signs of abuse in these movements, but the intention was there and it's, it's good. It's a good intention, I think. And there have been good programs, good uh, processes now to make sure that the people serving are, you're actually serving because they, they're, you know, their heart's right. I think John Wesley was a very scrupulous judge of character. He asked people million, lots of questions and I think he could very easily tell if somebody's heart was in it. So that probably alone was some way of weeding out the people that were problems. But uh, I think that uh, churches have gone away from, from this kind of thing in this last century. I think churches have become, probably because society's changed a lot too, we've lost a little bit of our communities. And uh, so I think we can benefit, like you're saying, as you're saying, Vanessa, we can benefit if we could do some of these things again. Like uh, one of them is soup, you know, soup kitchens, um, feeding people, but also education too. We're lucky we have, we have a preschool here and even though it's not officially part of our church, you know, we have a really close relationship with that. And so she's doing lots of good in the community and she also is teaching them Christian values in her preschool. She likes this connection to a church. She doesn't consider herself like a sec, more secular, but instilling the values of the Christian faith there uh, in her church. And so I remember when she painted the church, I mean, she painted her preschool she also painted that cross up in front, you know, and put up another one too that I think came out. So, you know, I think these, these are the kind of things that the church can influence. These values that we have as Christians about caring for each other, I think it can benefit society. 
whether you choose to be a believer or not. It's, it's, these are things that have been instilled in our culture. And I think it's good to, to continue to do these things. I agree. Um, how might we, uh, how might like, uh, so as I mentioned, a lot of churches have, have kind of gone away with the community involvement. Uh, and it's hard because, you know, you need resources and time and money and things like that. But how might churches uh, benefit from having some of those, those things that really having classes like this, for example, uh, having uh, group meetings, maybe gathering together with close friends and praying together and things like that. Uh, Well, I think just being a night, you know, welcoming to when they do, people do come, right? Uh, Betty was asking uh, about uh, helping the homeless. How do we get them off the street? Or is that what you're, yeah, yeah. Well, we can't really. I mean, we don't have the, the ability to do it, but we can point people to resources. I mean, one of the reasons why it's great to be working with this, with the Maui Rescue Mission is they have some people there that get people signed up for housing. And that's a start, yeah. So they're doing things like that, even though the other side of it though, is maybe we could pressure our county government to build more housing, <laughs> to, to, uh, to do things like that, you know, I think, or at least let people know that we support that if, if they decide to do that as, as a church. Yeah, county and state. I mean, I think there, there are programs, uh, there are bills that, to build housing, but it's, all, it's always, the need I think is greater than the, our ability to meet them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great need. So maybe there's a stopgap thing. Maybe more uh, shelters. Maybe more shelters that provide some sort of freedom for people to come back. I don't know. There's lots of different things we could do. But uh, I think helping groups that are doing great things like the Salvation Army, um, the, res the uh, Resource Center, the um, uh, Maui Rescue Mission, Maui Food Bank, all these wonderful organizations that are doing so much good in the community. And individual churches too. You know, individual churches can come together and do things together. You know, we, we don't have a lot of people. Uh, other churches may be dealing with the same. If we come together, we have a lot of people. So we'll see. We'll see. Okay. I think that's all. Any, anybody else have any other observations or? Okay. All right. So let's close in prayer. O oh Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done. We thank you for your grace so freely extended. As we grow in grace, make your will known to us. Stir us with co compassion, love, and mercy that we may become more fully what you intend us to be as we are perfected in love. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, thank you very much. All right. Good session. Aloha. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Huh? Oh, you had a question. Oh, she said good session, I think. Did you have a question, Jane? No. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I like this. This is a portrait of John Wesley later in life. I like that portrait. <laughs> okay. Aloha, everyone. Aloha.